Brothers and sisters, we're now going to turn to Matthew chapter 6. And this has in it, of course, some very important things in relation to us personally, if that hasn't been the case so far. I think you would agree it has been. But this is about our worship, the way we go about our worship before our God. In Matthew 6, we have, in verses 1 to 4, worship in relation to men. In verses 5 to 15, worship in relation to God. In verses 9 to 15, which is a component of that section of verses, we have, of course, the Lord's Prayer. In verses 16 to 18, we have worship in relation to self. And that doesn't mean self-worship. It means in the matter of fasting, all right, how we go about things privately. Worship in relation to self. So each of these aspects is very important for us, isn't it? Because this is what our daily life in the truth is about. It's about giving in service, worshipping our God, uh, etc. So we're going to explore these things in the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's extremely important, of course, that we get these things right. His generation didn't have it right. They didn't have their understanding correct on these things. So the personal issues that are, that are going to be covered in this study are acts of giving, that service offered to the truth, acts of worship, that is devotions given, and acts of self-denial, the sacrifices that we make. So they're the three personal issues we're going to be considering uh, in this final study for today. Brother Sergeant is going to lead us off again. In the teaching of the Master, he says this, for those who have this vision, worship will not be an occasional act, but a constant attitude. Life will be orientated towards God. Christ alone is the perfect example of that orientation. So the character that we considered in chapter 5, verses 1 to 12, is, is the background, isn't it, in the entire discourse. We're looking at the man Christ Jesus as the very manifestation of the character of God. And we're called upon, our calling to the truth, brothers and sisters, is not just for our salvation. It is going to be for our salvation. But it's not really about that, is it? It's about the glory of God. We have been called that God might be glorified. So that in the manifestation of his character now, and the perfection of that manifestation in the kingdom, he will be glorified. Not us, him. So you see, that's why we've been called to the truth. It's not really about us. It's about God. And once we get that right in our mind, then our life can be properly directed. If we really think like the churches do, that it's about us, we're never going to get there. It's not about us. It is about God. So I want you to have a look with me at this section. Now, the word that sticks out of this section from verse 1 to verse 18 is this word reward. And there are, in fact, two Greek words used here for reward. Let's read verse 1. Take heed that you do not your arms, the, the margin of my Bible has got your righteousness, don't do your righteousness before men, to be seen of them, which of course we know from Matthew 23 is exactly what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing. They were doing it to be seen of men. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father, which is in heaven. So this is the word that's going to dominate this section. Now, the word arms here is this Greek word, which actually means mercy or pity, particularly in giving arms. Other texts have the Greek word diakosuni, which means righteousness, and the RV margin has that. So, so does my Bible, the Oxford Bible, it has righteousness. So you get the idea. One or the other will do, won't they? This is actually what you're doing in acts of service. It can be called righteousness, it can be called arms. Now this word reward here is the word misthos. It actually means pay for service. So you, you see what he's saying, brothers and sisters? The, the scribes and the Pharisees, when they set out to offer their arms, you know, their contributions to the temple, etc., they were actually looking for some payment in reward, payment for service. The word is used six times in the, in the discourse. Why do you think it's used six times? Because six is the number of man. This is how man operates, isn't it? 
So you can see it in chapter 5, verse 12, verse 46, 6, 1, verse 2, verse 5, verse 16. Its final use is in Revelation 22, verse 12. The word relates to hire, or wages, or pay. And it is said to have been used in the receipts of the day. So that when you got a receipt from someone, this was the word in the Greek they used. That you've actually, you know, you've received something. And you sign off on it. So it's got to do with getting some kind of pay for what you do. That's not our motivation, isn't it? But what the Lord is saying, brothers and sisters, is that if this is your way of life, life like it was that of the scribes and Pharisees, that is your pay. You don't get any more. You've got your reward now. And that reward is you are seen in the eyes of people as being righteous. Right? Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want the praise of men. You know, it, it's ephemeral, isn't it? Today they're praising you, tomorrow they're, they're insulting you or abusing you. I don't want the praise of men. It's not worth anything. You and I want the praise of God, don't we? We want the praise of God at the judgment seat. So we've got to get this right as well. The reward of men, the singular motive of the Pharisees was self-worship. All their acts of piety were a theatrical performance. Matthew 23, verse 5. All their works they, they do for to be seen of men. It's like going into a theatre and seeing play actors on the stage. That's what they were like. Seen is the word theomai. To gaze upon, to look at with a purpose, to see with desire, to regard with admiration. It's derived from the verb theoros, which means a spectator. Yeah, so they wanted spectators for their acts of righteousness. You know, this is really all drawn from the Old Testament. Now, this might be a little bit of an aside, but it's, I think, relatively important. You'll remember the allegory of Galatians chapter 4. Remember that? Where Paul says there were two women and they had two sons, one each. There was Hagar, he says. Hagar bore Ishmael to Abraham, remember? Yes, he represents the Jews living under law. Hagar, he says, is the Mosaic covenant, the one at Mount Sinai. And her children... The natural Jew, the seed of Abraham, who kept law, are Ishmael. Ishmael represents all them. Then you've got Sarah. And Sarah represents the Abrahamic promises. And her children are freeborn. Born by the power of the Spirit. They represents you and me, members of the Ecclesia. Okay? Born by the power of the Word of God. We're free. Free from law. Got the picture? Well, in Genesis 16 and verse 12... This is what we read about Ishmael. Now you can check me out on this. There's a word missed out in the King James Version in Genesis 16 verse 12. If you have another translation, it might put it in. It's the word Kamor. I see you're looking that up. You're intrigued, don't you? Let's come back to Genesis chapter 16. We started early. We've got an extra minute. Genesis 16 and verse 12. And he will be, this is the angel's words to Hagar in the wilderness, a wild man. Now, the word kamor is there in the Hebrew. It should read, a wild ass of a man. A wild ass of an Adam, actually. Now, what's the ass the symbol of? Kamor, it's the male ass here, by the way. C-H-A-M-O-R. It's a symbol for the nation of Israel. Okay? So Ishmael becomes the symbol in the allegory for the nation of Israel living under law. And we read in Genesis 16 verse 12, His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. Now, I'm not going to take you there, but if you just jot down the first epistle of the Thessalonians, so that's 1st of Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, the apostle picks up this language and he says... The Jews, he says, you're persecuted by the Jews who killed their own Messiah. You know what he says? And they are contrary to all men. That's what Paul says. They're contrary to all men. Ishmael, his hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And that's been the character of the Jewish nation through their whole history, isn't it? But there's a third thing. In Genesis 16 verse 12. 
And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Do you dwell in the presence of all your brethren? Oh, I do. So it doesn't mean that, does it? What does it mean? Well, you might want to make a, a, just a, a brief note. To, alongside of Genesis 16 verse 12 to Genesis 25 and verse 18 because Genesis 25 verse 18 will tell you that Ishmael died in the presence of all his brethren okay so what do you reckon that means well we've just sadly had to lay to rest in Largo today a brother he died as it were in the presence of his brethren and there in, in attendance at his funeral do you think it means that? No. You know what it means in the allegory, brothers and sisters? It means that because Ishmael is a type of Jews, natural Jews living under law, everything that they do is for to be seen by their brethren. They dwell in the presence of their brethren. It's all about public consumption. And that's what they were about. And Christ puts his finger on that in Matthew 23, verse 5. So... Yet in the presence of all his brethren shall he have his habitation is an indication of the character of the Jewish people right down to our day. We've just been to, to the land of Israel in October last year. We went into the synagogue at Hebron and it was 7 o'clock at night and there were all these religious Jews, these Orthodox Jews dressed up in their regalia and they got the big scroll, the Torah in front of them and they're going around. <laughs> What's that about, brothers and sisters? It's about show. When I was there at the Sea of Galilee in 2010, there was a gentleman, a young fellow in his 20s who came out, and he sat on a boat that was, it was sort of like a boat. And he sat on that boat and he got out his phylacteries, and he's looking around to see if there's an audience. And he puts on his phylacteries on his head and on his arms. What's that about? Public consumption. Ishmael. That's Ishmael. See? He dwells in the presence of his brethren. All about what they think of him. Quite frankly, I don't care what you think about me. I really mean, I don't care what you think about me. I only care what God thinks about me. That's the most important thing, brothers and sisters. You've got that attitude, you can handle any problem that comes along. Can't you? Well, let's come back to Matthew 6. Because this is what they used to do in verse 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine arms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now trumpets, of course, the silver trumpets, were used in Numbers chapter 10, verse 10, to draw attention... God's attention to the offering of sacrifice. Not that he needed his attention drawn, but of course it was about Israel saying to God, they blew the trumpet, the silver trumpet, which stands for redemption, that's what silver represents in the word of God, we acknowledge our need for redemption. Here is our sacrifice, calling God's attention to their sacrifices, see? Well, they used to blow it for self-advertisement in Christ's day. It's a vivid metaphor for self-advertisement. Based on the contemporary custom, during public fasts, at the end of six benedictions or blessings, concluding prayers for rain to break the autumn droughts, the shofar was blown on this occasion. So that's the ram's horn, isn't it? It was blown in public places and then almsgiving was expected from the people. And you up, up you trotted with your handful of coins. And you came up to this trumpet-shaped thing. Yes, it was like a trumpet-shaped thing. You've seen one of those things, the, you know, the dog sitting beside the big trumpet thing. Like that. And you... Put your coins in and it went clang, 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 clang down the bottom. People looked from, whoa, he's generous. It was all for public consumption. That's, that's what they did. Now, we wouldn't do that, of course. Now, there just happened to be 13 of these shofaroth in the temple. And 13 is the number of rebellion in the word of God. His trumpet-shaped openings for depositing money in the treasury were designed to draw maximum attention to the offerer. Now, what do you reckon the sound of two mites that the widow woman put in there would have made? Nobody would look anywhere. No one would look around, would they, for the widow? But she gave everything that she had. The other rich people came in and dropped in a handful of coins. 
And everybody looked around and said, oh, he is a very generous man. That's their reward. That's all they get. You reckon that's worth it? Nah. We want the praise of God. Now, he says in verse 3 something very interesting. But when thou doest arms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Now, the left hand is, by the way, brothers and sisters, I'm sorry for those who are left-handed. <coughs> but the left hand is the biblical symbol for mortal weakness. I can prove that to you absolutely. From Judges chapter 3, it's all over. So don't even bother shouting, okay? It's all over. It's the hand of mortal weakness. The right hand, we know from the scripture, is the hand of divine authority. So, the right hand, therefore, represents works governed by God. The kind of works he wants. True? Your left hand's got to do with your mortal weakness. So what, is, what does he say? He says, don't let your mortal weakness be made aware of what you're doing for God. Now that's difficult, isn't it? Because when I do something that I know is right, my little brain says... You're a good boy. <laughs> and not only is God going to be impressed with you, but anybody who sees you do this is going to be impressed with you. Now, this by the way, am I unusual? Do you think? Like, look. <laughs> this... <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> I don't think I'm unusual at all. I think that's the way we naturally think, isn't it? Yeah. So you get the point of this, don't you? The problem they had was that everything they did was about the then and now. It was about getting the praise of men now. And if that's the course we're set on, that's all you get. Don't expect to get a reward of the judgment seat, because it's not coming. So look at verse 4. That thine arms may be in secret. Now, this is the other word that dominates this context, the word secret. They may be in secret, and that thy father which seeth in secret himself, notice this, it could have just said, couldn't it, that he seeth in secret, he shall reward the open. He says, himself. In other words, this is exactly what God wants from us. Now this word secret, kryptos, means in the secret or hidden place. It's used six times in the discourse, all here. Okay, all in this section of scripture. Now six, of course, is the number of man, isn't it? So what we are being told, brothers and sisters, is we've got a problem. The problem was seen in Christ's day. We want others to think that we're doing okay. We want others to think that we're righteous, that we're, that we're doing the right thing. That's our problem. But we've got to learn. We've got to learn what this secret thing is all about. So we're going to pursue this as we proceed. goes on to say, he which seeth in secret, this word seeth blepo, Metaphorically means to see with the mind's eye, to have the power of, the un of understanding, to discern mentally, to observe, perceive, discover, or understand. God sees straight through us, brothers and sisters. He sees every motive. He knows every thought. There's nothing we can hide from him. He sees straight through us. But a different word for reward is used in verse 4. In the King James it says, He shall reward thee openly. This word reward is apodidomi. It means to deliver, to give back, to restore, to recompense. Now, this is not payment. This is not wages in payment. This is, this is God recompensing you. In other words, if you do this the right way, there is a reward that he's going to give, personally give, at the judgment seat of Christ. In recompense for your sacrifice and for your diligence and for your secret relationship with him. So you see, this, this word secret is used throughout the scripture, and particularly in the, in the New Testament. And here are just a few references about the secret of the heart. Luke eight seventeen, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest. Romans 2, 16. God shall judge the secrets of men. Romans 2, 29. He is a Jew which is one inwardly or secretly, so to speak. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5, bring to light the hidden things of darkness. 1 Corinthians 14 25, 
Thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. So we're going to have to focus on this, aren't we? Because it's a scriptural thing here. And this is what Brother Sargent says about this in the teaching of the Master. When he bestows the gift which he has prepared, the Father who knows your secret relation to him will openly show his love for you. The reward is reward indeed. But it is above all else the expression of a relationship, the seal of fellowship, the evidence that he has adopted men and women as sons and daughters. Reward is the mark of God's delight in those who are redeemed and reconciled and embraced in his purpose. Fear not, he quotes Luke 12.32, Fear not, little flock, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do you think there's any greater reward than that? Can you ever be rewarded greater than that? I know, brothers and sisters, you feel exactly the same way as I feel about this. I can't wait for the return of Christ. I've had enough. I've had enough of this world. I've had enough of the struggle. I just want Christ to come. And if I died tomorrow or tonight, I'd be happy with that. It'd be all over. That brother who's been laid to rest today, is the, he's the most blessed brother in this area of Florida. Because he's now asleep. Christ has come for him. Christ is here for that brother, because the next waking moment the angel will be bringing him up out of the grave taking him off to meet his master and if you've been faithful there's no doubt where you're going, if your sins are forgiven you go there blameless because you've asked God for forgiveness and they're all out of the record, they're gone he will take them out of the record you know, they can be gone you go to the right hand and eventually after 12 months waiting you'll turn to all of those on his right and say come ye blessed of my father Enter thou to the joy of thy Lord, and in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. That'll be a reward enough for me. I'll take the lowest place in the kingdom, providing I'm on the right hand. I think you might be prepared to share that with me. Just want to be in the kingdom. Not for my sake. I'm not worthy to be there, brothers and sisters. I want to be there to see the glory of God cover this earth. I want to see the vindication of God's righteousness. I want to see men humbled, bow the knee before the Son of God. I want to see God magnified in the earth. So do you. And that's why. That's why we stick to the truth. We're not going to give this up for anybody, are we? Nobody is going to take us away from what we know is real and is about to become a reality in our own person when we are changed. What a reward that will be. But the Pharisee worked for wages. Brother Sargent says the Pharisees expect a wage for their works. The disciple is promised a bounty for his living faith. Another wonderful summary of what the Lord is talking about here. Christ is now going to make the transition from arms to prayer. Now, prayer is the hallmark of our relationship with God. This is the touchstone of how you're getting on in your relationship with God. How often? How effectively do you pray? What's your relationship like? Now, if you're married, some of you have been married, okay? If you've been married or you are married, you know this, that relationships don't work without communication. If you can't talk to your partner about a whole range of things, in fact, everything, then that relationship's not going to be successful, is it? And the same with you and, and God. He talks to you through his word. You speak back to him through prayer. Now, if that communication is strong and regular, then you have a relationship. But it's not something that your next door neighbour will know about necessarily, except in your behaviour, you know, the way you act. It's a secret thing, isn't it? It's a secret between you and God. This is what Brother Sargent says about seeing him who is invisible. The clue to the mind and practice of the saint is to be found in the repeated phrase, the Father which is in secret. He is the King Eternal, incorruptible, invisible, the only God. And those who love him will live as seeing him who is invisible. Withdrawing from distraction, they will come from time to time into a realm where the measure and standards of men no longer exist. It's a very, very personal thing, isn't it? Our relationship with God. 
He goes on to say this about the secret of true disciples. The unbeliever walks wholly in the visible world. For him there is neither secret place nor invisible being. The disciple has a secret for which he goes into an inner room and his secret is God. It's a pretty effective way of demonstrating what Christ is going to be talking about here in Matthew chapter... But I haven't quite finished. Because we've got a contrast. We've got the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees and others, which sears their conscience. And Brother Sargent says this, The man who begins by deceiving his fellows goes on to try to deceive God and ends by deceiving himself. Hypocrisy is the most corrupting of vices because it sears the very conscience. So let's come and have a look at this section on prayer. Verse 7. Sorry, verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their receipt their payment. They've got their wages. That's that word missos we met back in verse 1. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which seeth in secret, and he shall reward thee openly. You got a picture about that, brothers and sisters? Now the Jews had an hour of prayer. In Acts chapter 3 verse 1, they had an hour of prayer. It was 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And some of the scribes and Pharisees who wanted to impress their fellows, well, they didn't have accurate clocks in those days. They had sundials and things like that. But they were accurate enough for you to leave in time, to leave your home in Jerusalem in time, to be in the temple before the hour of prayer began. But they would deliberately delay. Because they wanted only to be halfway there or just nearly there. When the hour of prayer came and the trumpet sounded for everybody to start praying. Now, the apostles went up into the temple at the hour of prayer in Acts chapter 3, didn't they? Verse 5. Many Pharisees were deliberately late, so they were caught at street corners. Oh, it's so sad. Uh, you know, the trumpet sounded at the hour of prayer at 3 p.m., and I just happened to be only 100 yards from the temple, but it just happened to be on a street corner where I could be seen from both directions. So I'm going to have to pray here on this street corner. Isn't that sad? It was all about public consumption. You know, to be seen of men. Now, we come to the Lord's Prayer here in a moment, don't we? The essence of prayer, this prayer in particular, is total dependence on God and repudiation of human worth. And they were all about publicising human worth. Volubility. Eloquence, which is the subject of verse 7, you see, but when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be ye not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. Okay, so he's leading into the Lord's Prayer here. So volubility and eloquence and fervour are all absolutely hollow if they're simply designed to impress men. And that's what the scribes and Pharisees and others were about. Now, when he talks about vain repetitions here in verse 7, the Greek is batologio, logio, speech. It means to babble, to repeat idly, and vine and bulliger, both of them in their lexicons of the Greek language, say, describe the person who stuttered and stammered, then to babble, so as to use empty words. A bit like that, that Orthodox Jew, you know, blah, 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 blah. You see him at the wall? You've been to Jerusalem, seen him at the wall? That's what he's talking about. Repeated phrase over and over and over and over again. Like the prophets of Baal. The first of Kings chapter 18. Remember them? Oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal. And went on for hours. Hours. That's all they said. You see, God knows what we're going to ask before we speak. Okay. So, we don't have to have volubility, do we? This word describes the meaningless, meaningless, 
of mechanically repeated phrases common to pagan modes of prayer, just like I pointed out in 1 Kings 18, verse 26. And Ecclesiastes 5, verse 2 is helpful. God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Recognize the the position. Recognize your position. Therefore let thy words be few. So prayers have got to be, they've got to be pristine. As best we can do that with our mortal weakness. Not any repeated hackneyed phrases that are useless to God and to us. The simplicities of a prayer that goes straight to the point and doesn't imagine that God is impressed with a whole volume of things. He's not. He wants sincerity of heart. I've heard some good prayers here, by the way, today. He wants sincerity of heart. And that's, brothers and sisters, something that we have to learn. It doesn't come naturally. And what about the Lord's Prayer? A lot could be said about that. We could give a whole session, a whole study on just this prayer alone. It has, of course, an important structure. And it's the kind of structure we need to feed into our prayers. God must always come first. That's why this prayer begins, as you can read there in verse 9, Our Father, which art in heaven. It's an acknowledging, acknowledgement of his supremacy and of his position. Then there are three petitions relating to his glory. So he's not only first, he's second. Hallowed be thy name, which means to set it apart. Thy kingdom come, which is about where he's called us to be. And thy will be done, as it is by the angels, here on earth. In other words, he wants us to do that now, because we're going to be the ones who bring this to people in the, in the millennial period. We're going to teach them how to perform the will of God, just like the angels do it now in heaven. So there are three petitions relating to his glory. Then there are three petitions relating to man's needs. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts, and lead us not into temptation. So that's our needs. So we come well down the track, don't we? But then how does it finish? Well, concluding praise of God. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So what does that teach us in its simplicity, brothers and sisters? God comes first. And God comes last. Right? You and I are in the middle there somewhere. We have a great dependency upon him. We acknowledge that. Even that gives him glory, doesn't it? To acknowledge our dependency gives him glory. So it's really all about the glory of God. So our prayers need to be framed that way. All too often, prayers are about us, aren't they? should be about God. If our brethren in Cameroon have, have received the protection of our God, We give thanks that he's actually been glorified because people asked him for help. Right? That's to his glory, isn't it? So it's all about the glory of God. But what about this phrase, deliver us from evil? Well, the sergeant says this. Yet the petition is unerringly placed at the climax. It is the last stage in the education in prayer which has been carried forward step by step in this Lord's Prayer. The child, spiritually or physically, will as like as not be confident in its own self-sufficiency, will be foolishly venturesome. The words are baffling to undeveloped minds, he says. But the last three petitions imply the breaking down, one by one, of the defences of the inner self. First, prayer for bread is a confession of a dependence on God for physical life and a recognition that what is received is only a slave's allowance, not something possessed in our own right. Secondly, prayer for forgiveness confesses dependence on God for the very condition which makes fellowship with him possible and requires us to reflect the sunlight of his goodness upon others. And finally, prayer that the leading of God may be away from temptation rather than into it is the overthrow of self-sufficiency's last refuge. It is the admission that we are not strong enough to court trial 
I can say, Amen to that. And so could you. Let's come then to fasting, to verse Matthew chapter 6 and verse 16. Now, I didn't make mention, of course, of forgiving men their trespasses. Do I need to make mention of that, brothers and sisters? I think we've already been exhorted enough on that count today, haven't we? We don't learn to forgive, we will not be forgiven ourselves. Verse 16. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Now, I guess if you put on sackcloth, which is called like a rough, very rough sort of sack stuff, but it's got prickles in it, and you're sitting there, of course you're going to be going, ugh, ugh, that's awful. You get a picture? Yeah. And if you've got dust on your head, and you get, you're sweating, and this dust is coming down, ugh, ugh. It's very impressive, isn't it? Very impressive. To whom? Not to God, but to your fellows who are sitting around with you. Say, well, we are really enduring some terrible stuff here. God must really like this. Now, the Pharisees actually fasted twice in a week, Monday and Thursday. These were occasions, of course, for sanctimonious display and public piety. The Pharisee, of course, of Luke 18, verse 12, it's a ludicrous scenario, this. In that parable, you remember about the two men? The one who wouldn't look up to heaven because he really believed that God was there. And he didn't feel as though he could address God. He said, he uses six words, by the way, in the Greek. He says, oh God, forgive me a sinner. He wouldn't even look up. Why? Because he really believed he was there. The other man prays to himself. And six times he uses the personal pronoun if you add another one. Oh God, he means himself. I. I fast twice. I, 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 it's all I. He's his own God. Okay? Now the ludicrous scenario is, it says in the King James, I fast twice in the week. But the Greek word is sabbatismos. It means the Sabbath. Twice in the Sabbath. That's a bit overdone, isn't it? All right, twice in the Sabbath. So Christ is making a mockery of the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees. Isaiah 58, where this all comes from, of course, verse 5 says this, Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day, meaning one day, for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush, to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call that a fast? An acceptable day to Yahweh? Of course, the answer is obvious, isn't it? It's not a fast. God's not going to recognise this stuff. Because it's for public consumption. Brother Sergeant says this. It may be required of us that we shall do more than others. But not that we shall be seen to do more. The last great bastion of the flesh, brothers and sisters, is the third in the list of First John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. I could probably speak for you. You know, I've got my issues with the lust of the flesh, but they're nothing like what I was when I was younger. And you know what I mean. They're not quite the same danger to me as when I was younger. And as for the lust of the eyes, I can pass by miles of car yards with all these flashy cars, and I can go into shopping. I'm not interested. Not interested. I've got enough, more than enough. But I'm still struggling with the last bastion of the flesh. So there's the lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye. What's the third one? The pride of life. It finally destroyed great men like Ahithophel, Asa, the king of Judah, Isaiah, the king of, of Judah, who thought he was the Messiah. Pride is the last stronghold of carnality that we have to deal with in our lives. The last stronghold. It may yet beat me, brothers and sisters. It may yet beat me. Because you see, we do like, we do enjoy being seen, don't we? Be seen of men and praised of men. We get, we get some sort of thrill out of that. You know, it releases dopamine in our brain. It's, it's the pleasure chemical of our brain. So, you know, we, we, we've got a problem. All of us have got a problem with pride. And don't think that the meek people haven't got a problem with pride. Like I said a little earlier, sometimes you find out they're 
they're, they're worse off. Because when you tread on their toes, you find out that pride is their big hurdle. It is the last bastion of the flesh. Let's recognise it. This is what Brother Sargent says about the touchstone of reality. He says this, Only to the man of faith can such a communion be possible. But he who has it will be in touch with reality. Not only so, but he will have a core of reality within himself. A touchstone for the half-truths that come from his own nature. For the shams in the world around him. He will be more than truthful. He will be a man of truth. He is unmoved by the judgment of men, not from pride towards them, but from humility towards God. It's the touchstone of reality. These people here, in verses 16 to 18, deliberately went out to be noticed by the public. What does Christ say in verse 17? But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face. In other words, don't appear to be suffering. Fasting's about self-denial, isn't it? It's about self-denial. So when you choose to deny yourself in order to labour for God, which you usually do by labouring for his people, it's how we labour for God. We labour for his people, his children. When you do that, then don't publicise it in any way. Don't, sit, don't ring up someone and say this, I'm going to go and visit Brother So-and-so. He's in real trouble. I'll tell you what's, what I do, brothers and sisters. I want you to know. I want you to know that I go and do this and I go and do that. Because I'm scoring brownie points in my brain. Well, I've had my reward. That won't be in the book at the Day of Judgment, because I've had my reward. It'll be what you do in secret that will be brought up at the judgment seat. That's why Nehemiah said, constantly said, remember me for good. Obviously he'd ask for forgiveness, didn't he, for his sins, so they won't be remembered. Remember me for good. He wanted God to see his private suffering and self-denial on behalf of others. Not that they might see it and give him a present reward, because he wants the future one. And that's what you and I want, brothers and sisters. And tomorrow, God willing, by the will of God, if we are here, in our first session tomorrow, we're going to have a look at the rest of Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to see that seeking first the kingdom of God has to be the primary motivation of our lives. Let us serve the God whom we love, who seeth in secret, but is going to reward us openly in public at the judgment seat of